Hello my friends, and welcome to another Robcast. In this one, you're going to meet Ched Myers. And I don't even know how to warn you for what's coming your way. But I would just say this. It's so important to know that all the radical new ideas that you're exploring, that other people have been exploring these ideas for a long time. Do you know what I'm saying? Because often what happens is there's this like terror, like, does, I mean, isn't anybody else talking about this or seeing this or thinking about this? And the answer is, yeah, they are. They are. And actually one of the things, uh, and the reason why I like to interview people for the Robcast from time to time is, first off, it's just my own curiosity. I, w I want to understand more about them and how they move in the world and how they came to do and be whoever it is that they are. And I have admired Chad for a while, but the chance to actually talk with him was just was such an honor. But what you'll see is you'll see, oh, this is like another level. <laughs> so I am so happy for you to meet Chad. But before we do that, um, I've been doing bookstore tour, and last week was uh, L.A., and all of you who came out to the last bookstore, including Heidi, because it's a store, not a shop. <laughs> oh, it was so great. And I just absolutely adore the people at last bookstore and um what a just the crowd and then we were in chicago and i especially want to give a shout out to the mom who um told me that her husband died a couple years ago and she's raising three kids uh all alone so i, I want to um shout out grace and peace to you now more than ever and then to the crowd that came out in brooklyn that was hot and sweaty and wall to wall and that was just some serious love you know what i'm saying and um to that guy, John, in the middle, um, like maybe 10 rows back. <laughs> you know who you are. <laughs> I seriously love coming out and meeting you Robcast people. You are a different breed. You know what I'm saying? So this week I'll be in uh, Seattle and Portland. And then uh, the week after that, Denver, Minneapolis, and of course, Ohio. All that info is at uh, robbell.com. And then this summer is the Bible Belt Tour. Alabama, North Carolina, Georgia, Tennessee um, will be all over. Virginia, did I already say that? So tickets, um, there's still some tickets left for that, and that's in July. And then the fine folks at Chopra Center. I did an event last year with Deepak Chopra, and um, very creative people took uh, the talking I did down there and did a couple interviews and then made a class, an online class you can take from me called Taking the Leap with Rob Bell. And that's all at Chopra.com. And then this summer I'll be in the woods in August in the Redwoods south of Santa Cruz, Northern California at Multiversity. So 1440.org, 1440.org if you want to come spend the weekend with me talking about your atomic self and the science of the soul and, uh, oh, I know, seriously. We got good things going on. But right now, my friends, fasten your seatbelts because you're about to meet Ched Myers. Hello, my friends, and welcome to another Robcast. In this one, we're in the back house, and I've been a longtime fan, first time caller for our guest today. Ched Myers is in the back house. Welcome. Thank you, Rob. Thanks for having me. And Chad is here with his uh, entourage. <laughs> so if you hear laughter or noise or all sorts of background noise, that is because apparently you roll with a posse of sorts. <laughs> well, we were all curious to uh, see what was up. <laughs> so I'm delighted to welcome Tommy and Lindsay Airy, who are close colleagues of ours. Um, and uh, Tom edits the RadicalDiscipleship.net blog site, which is a really good thing that uh, we collaborate on, and my beloved partner, Elaine Enns, who's a big part of this work. So we just all thought we'd come, come down and check out the back, back house. I love it. Now, uh, to my <coughs> Robcast friends, you know that there are all these people out there who I am fascinated with and who have helped shape me, and so every once in a while I get to sit down with them. And so, Ched, um, for, do you describe yourself as an author? How, when people, you're at a party. People say, so what kind of work, what kind of stuff are you up to? What do you do when you're not here yeah. at parties? What do you say? Interesting that, that you ask. You know, I grew up here in uh, L.A., and then I was gone for about 10, 11 years and came back as a young adult and had published uh, uh, my first book. And so 
at parties, people ask me, what do you do? And they, I'd say, well, I'm a writer. And they'd say, oh, oh, so what's, what screenplays have you done? So, uh-huh. <laughs> so that, that weaned me off describing myself as a writer in L.A. Yeah, right. That <laughs> Outside of different. L.A., I'm okay being a writer. That's one of the things I do, yeah. So um, let me start with... Let's, let me start with some softball questions, So, because I want to watch you hit this ball. I'm going to toss you some underhand pitches so that you can hit the ball really hard. If someone says to you... I prefer a tee. Ch- <laughs> okay, I'm going to put the ball on the tee. So, because I want to introduce my audience to your work. If somebody said to you, I'm just into spiritual stuff, man. Don't give me politics. Don't give me economics. Don't give me care of the universe. I'm just about spirituality and the heart. Mm. What do you think about, you're with me, right, man? How do you respond to that? <laughs> yeah, well, I'd, I'd hope to be with them. Uh, spirituality is important, but uh, it does take a body to inhabit. And bodies, in turn, require economic and political and social spaces. So it's, in fact, impossible to have a spirituality uh, that is completely free-floating above all economics and politics. Um, that, that's actually an ancient uh, heresy in the Christian tradition called docetism. Uh, the idea of uh, Jesus was a spirit who didn't really inhabit a body. Uh, for the rest of us Smurfs, uh, we actually do inhabit bodies, and those bodies inhabit political space. So anybody who says that their spirituality is divorced from politics has actually made a choice, and that's usually a disastrous choice, both for them personally and for the body politic. So I, I would endeavor to knit back together that which is in fact inherent, and that is body, mind, and spirit. Has that always been at the heart of your work? Is that something that you stumbled into over time? Well, yeah, let's face it, we all stumble into things over time. Uh, I, I was not raised in the church, so uh, the, the fact that I was introduced to the Christian life of the spirit at uh, the age of 18, that was a novelty for me as a suburban L.A. kid, growing up during the Vietnam War and um, feeling pretty alienated. Uh, spiritual, um, dealing with my own spiritual alienation was a big big part of my early biography. Uh, and coming to faith uh, in the gospel was an important part of, of uh, addressing big questions about how and why as someone not raised in, in a religious And how, did, the, religious how did your new understanding or awareness, how did that answer those questions for you at 18? Well, that's, that, that was the rub. Um, I, was, I was pretty political, uh, politically precocious, um, suburbanite teenager. I was marching against the Vietnam War at age 14 and a vegetarian, and my brother was in Indochina. But uh, when I came to the faith and had uh, my first experience of little fundamentalist churches, um, they weren't they weren't addressing any of those questions. So I think um, that would have been a pretty short-lived experience for me, uh, that is, the church, had I not, in the year of the bicentennial, uh, 1976, (laughs) run across uh, the great Jesuit priest Daniel Berrigan, who was uh, uh, commenting on uh, American uh, culture and politics uh, and reading the book of Revelation uh, as part of his bicentennial discipline. And I heard that, and I said, Oh, that's what I signed up for. Where did that, you hear him? Where did you come across I, him? I was up in, uh, in Berkeley where I'd gone to university, and uh, he was giving a talk. Um, and I said, well, that's the holistic vision uh, that I'm looking for, one that brings spirituality and politics back together. It was a huge moment for me. And uh, a few months later, I was hitchhiking across the country to go live with his brother, Philip Berrigan, who, um, as it happens 10 years earlier, was the first Catholic priest to be arrested for civil disobedience in the history of the U.S. And uh, I apprenticed to uh, Philip and his wife, uh, Elizabeth McAllister, who, uh, as you know, were big parts of the um, Christian anti-war movement of the 60s and into the 70s and beyond. And and so that's where, that was sort of my second conversion uh, in the ghettos of Baltimore to see how the gospel, um, what it has to say about violence and about poverty and about racism. And what was that work like? So you would have been early 20s. Yeah, yeah, I was 21. And uh, you're in Baltimore. And what was, an, what, like, what was a day like? How were you being shaped? What were you seeing? And what was it that was giving you, oh, this, what was it, this works. This, this actually does something in the world. This is... 
Yeah, the the name of the community that uh, I went to uh, was was and is Jonah House. It still exists in Baltimore um, after the the prophet uh, and their mission. Uh, they they came out of the Catholic worker tradition, the great tradition founded by Dorothy Day Dorothy and Day, Peter yeah. Morin. Uh, but their particular charism or vocation was to bear public witness against the idolatry of U.S. militarism. And so they would routinely go down to the Pentagon and the White House to um, do what, they didn't call it this because they were Catholic, but I called this alternative evangelism uh, in which they would, um, well, Thanksgiving 1976, I was on the steps of the Pentagon um, dressed in rags because we were doing a little street theater, the poor starve while we build weapons of mass destruction. And all the veterans in the movement said, let's get the California kid in freezing um, November weather here in Washington, D.C. Let's dress him in rags <laughs> and let him freeze his ass off on the Pentagon steps. Uh, and, you know, we, we were all arrested. And, and that, that's the kind of stuff that they did. And that for me was, I mean, you know, that's, that's the gospel with teeth. You know, that's, that's backbone. That, that really appealed to me. And How uh, many times were you arrested? Uh, yeah, probably a dozen or so over the years. Not not as much as some. Yeah. You arrested a dozen times, not as much as some. Oh, yeah, a lot of our friends are up in triple digits. Our friend Bill Wiley Kellerman, he's got to be up in triple digits by now, a friend of theirs in Detroit. Yeah. Because, so. and for, for those who are brand new to the idea of any of this, because... Because for you, a spirituality rooted in the path of Jesus means you stand up to any idolatry. H how, do you, how do you explain it? Somebody says, I don't understand. How does Jesus and being arrested connect? Yeah. How, do you, how would you explain that? Yeah, well, it's, it's an ironic question, isn't it, that the readers of um, the New Testament read about Jesus being arrested and tortured and executed. They read about Paul in jail. They read about other apostles going to jail. And it still seems a strange question why followers of Jesus would go to jail. It's kind of ironic. Um, you remember the great, the great moment between uh, uh, Thoreau and Emerson in the late 19th century where um, Henry David Thoreau had been uh, put in jail for his war tax resistance. And Emerson, the great poet, comes and says, what are you doing in da jail, uh, David? And he says, what are you doing not in jail, Ralph? Uh, I, th I think that would be the kind of questions that my mentors at Jonah House very much pressed is, Given the conditions that we are we are in, um, how are we not pressing things harder and further than than we are? Why are we so domesticated? Um, why are we so afraid to speak? So let's go back to uh, your your book, Binding the Strong Man. I mean, people talk about it as the best commentary ever. I mean, it, you, you realize that book has like underground legend status. Well, it started underground, so I guess that's a good place for it, for it to stay. <laughs> okay, so to my readers, um, Chad wrote a book, which is a, a essentially a commentary, which is taking you through, and it's about the book of Mark. So it's just taking you verse by verse through the book of Mark, and I cannot recommend it enough. Um, so how, like the first line, the good news of Jesus Christ the Messiah. Mm. Can you, for my listeners, unpack what that line, because otherwise if you're stuck in a hotel in Des Moines in February and you find out that there's a Gideon's Bible and you open it up and you read Mark and it says, oh, Jesus Christ, the gospel, the Messiah, people just, oh, okay. But like in Binding the Strongman, you take people, this is what that meant in the first century and why that sentence alone is like pyrotechnics everywhere. Mm. We're not going to go through the whole gospel of Mark, are we? Well, we'll see. Yeah. <laughs> um, we'll see. Well, I'll you, decide. <laughs> you know, co context is everything, isn't it? And and people in churches are too, uh, well, people in the culture in general, for that matter, are too used to uh, taking texts out of context. And so then we end up with pretext. So trying to restore a text, um, in its, particularly in its social and historical context, seems a very important and faithful way to read these ancient scriptures. So uh, in the case of Mark 1.1, uh, the term good news was not, uh, which evangelicals will appreciate, uh, comes from the Greek evangelion, um, <clears throat> wasn't a, a term that Mark invented. It was actually a term of Roman propaganda that uh, was typically used by the, the Roman state to uh, uh, broadcast the uh, great nobility and innocence and power of the Roman Empire abroad. Uh, so by 
calling this story about a Palestinian peasant who had been executed by that empire good news was immediately joining a fracas uh, with the empire. Um, once that is taken out of that historical context, good news now is reduced to um, a spiritual law or brief prayer that one utters um, in the privacy of one's heart with no political consequences. That's a whole different deal. So that's, that's why it's uh, part of what we uh, in the radical discipleship movement really try to stress. The word radical means going to the roots from the Latin radix and for us that means two things. It means going to the roots of the issues that we face around us, whether they're poverty or racism or militarism, rather than dealing with symptoms, trying to understand the roots of these issues. But it also means going to the roots of our tradition, our counter-traditions, our counter-narratives. And for us um, in the church that means our scriptures. So it is important for us to uh, examine the roots more carefully of that story as a story that took place in a world as real as ours, right? With political conflicts and uh, economic and social disparity. How did those folks navigate that? Uh, that might give us a few clues as to how we navigate that. So um, <clears throat> how, and then like, and then you just gave me this book, um, Watershed Discipleship, Re-Inhabiting Bioregional Faith and Practice. Because in your work, politics is directly connected to soil. I picked that up again and again. Yeah, we, uh, we have a little slogan in our work that we use that we're constantly endeavoring to work at the intersection of the seminary, the sanctuary, the streets, and the soil, trying to bring the best of those to a rereading of our faith and practice. And uh, just as um, modern Western Christianity, as you well know because you talk about this a lot, has uh, abandoned or betrayed the body, so similarly has it abandoned and betrayed the land or the soil. Um, and here we are, it's 2017 in the back house. It's the 500th anniversary, it's the quincentenary of Luther's great protest that started the Protestant movement, where he says, here I stand, I can do no other as he's pounding that, those theses into the Wittenberg door. And if you interviewed most folks, Christian or not, um, where do you stand? Not only could not many of them not answer that in terms of belief systems, more of them could not answer that in terms of the actual ground they stand on, meaning what, would you take a, what piece of land would you take a stand on to defend against violation, against uh, degradation? Um, most people would say, well, I don't really know. I don't really love a piece of land. It's what Wendell Berry calls the crisis of affection in our culture. We are a placeless society. We are constantly mobile. Uh, and that is one of the reasons why our industrial culture is pillaging the environment, because actually folks don't care enough to defend it. Uh, Baba Dioum, a great uh, environmentalist, African environmentalist for the 1960s, put it this way. He says, you, you, you won't defend uh, or protect places you don't love, but you can't love places you don't know, and you can't know places you haven't learned. It's that catechism of place, of the bioregions that we're in, the, the actual land and waters in which we reside. Uh, that's fallen off the map, and that's one of the things we're interested in reconstructing uh, as, a, as part of the radical ethos of figuring out where do we stand and what places are we going to defend. So how do you, I think about, uh, you go now to so many towns and there used to be like a main street where there was like a hardware store and an ice cream shop and a movie theater and an appliance store. Yeah. And now that is like empty but then you go out to the exit on the freeway and there's a Chili's, a Best Buy, yeah. a T-Mobile, uh, a Bubba Gump shrimp, like there's like the 19 restaurants that are, or it's shops that are everywhere. Um, and all places, you know, in art theory, they talk about thisness, the, what distinguishes this from that, and it's yeah. thisness, and things are losing their thisness, like geography. So how do you, Let's say a group says, please come to our place, wherever, Texas, Ohio, Boston, wherever. Help us think about this. How would you begin with them? 
Uh, well, I'd probably begin by negotiating a video conference so that I didn't have to leave my place <laughs> to talk to them about their place. Um, <clears throat> because Good I did, answer. like you, I did a lot of traveling, um, and I, I'm more interested now in really how we can get folks to pay attention. Look, uh, we, we've, we've got to understand that we dwell on land that holds stories, mostly of which we are ignorant. Uh, Elaine, uh, my partner, does a lot of work on intergenerational trauma and how people bear stories of trauma, but the, then the land we live on or settle on as immigrants or settlers, colonists, also bears land. So it's not just that Main Street USA has been paved over by Walmart. It's that um, indigenous villages were paved over by early colonial industrial agriculture. And then um, the, the, the yeoman farms of the early European settlers were paved over by more mechanized industrial uh, agriculture. And then that agriculture was paved over by spreading suburbanization. And then you end up at Bubba Gumps and Chili's. So this is a long history mm -hmm. of, um, of destruction of place. And Riding shotgun with the destruction of place is the displacement of people, beginning with indigenous people, but then immigrant and settlers moving around the landscape, chasing the money, right? Following boom and bust of American capitalism so that nobody really knows where to call home. And that's a, that's a huge form of not just um, uh, cultural alienation, but of spiritual loneliness, uh, that I think most North Americans suffer to some extent from. And uh, churches and spiritual leaders are going to have to be addressing this um, in its fullness, both as a political problem and an economic problem, but also as a spiritual problem. It strikes me that one of the dominant narratives of the scriptures is exile, <clears throat> and not just, ge as not just a geographic reality. You're far from home at some level of soul and spirit. Yeah. Well, you bring up Israel, uh, and Israel, actually, the story of Israel um, shows us lots of snapshots about the fate of human communities. So you have the snapshot of, of the Hebrews as slaves under the Egyptian empire. Well, that's still a reality for a lot of people around the world. And then you have uh, the Israelites doing their massive walkout under Moses and uh, going into the wilderness and existing very much on the margins. And that's how many people have tried to find freedom throughout history, is just saying, existing in the in-between places. And then you have a snapshot of Israel settled in the land of Canaan uh, and attempting to build a society where everyone can live beneath their vine and fig tree, but instead ending up building a society a of new rich Egypt. and poor and a new yes. Egypt. Solomon uh, builds a temple to the God who rescues people from slavery using yeah, slaves. That's, that's There's a new right. Pharaoh. Which is why the, the, the prophets say, you know, the first time God hears your cry, but if then you rebuild an empire in the name of that God, God will not hear your cry the second time. That's Second Samuel 8. So, uh, so then Israel being a small nation, is conquered by larger nations and becomes itself displaced and taken into exile. Well, a whole lot of people throughout the history of the world have had that experience of um, being conquered and being taken forcibly, um, not least African Americans in, in, our, uh, in our culture. So uh, <clears throat> all of those uh, tropes, if you will, not just exile, but slavery, uh, marginality, um, settledness in a beloved vineyard, to, to cite uh, Isaiah 5. All of those are things that I think we can learn from, from Scripture, if we have the eyes to see those as, if you will, archetypal statements about people trying to yeah. live peaceably and justly. It's like the fundamental questions humans have been asking for thousands of years. Yeah. And, th and that's one of the reasons why we emphasize um, trying to rebuild biblical literacy, uh, and as you know very well, Rob, uh, working in churches and with church folk, um, whether they're high church, low church, or no church, biblical literacy is actually quite low in the churches. People know sound Absolutely. bites, but they don't know stories, Absolutely. and they don't know the deep tradition. Absolutely. So trying to rebuild that literacy, but doing that where context is important, where where the, the historical shape of the narrative is important, uh, and where building analogies between then and now is important. Uh, that's, a, that's a piece of theological or spiritual work, yes, but it's also a piece of cultural work. 
in a in a society that in many ways is um, still in a hangover of toxic Bible um, sound bites uh, that's you know driving the Trump administration that kind of thing. Okay, because that's where I wanted to ask next. You. Have. Rob, Rob just got excited there. He just jumped up in his well, chair. Well, I'm so interested in how you, you have this uh, significant depth of understanding of larger movements throughout history, not just a sacred text, but how displacement, home, empire building. Do, do you, like last year, did you follow the presidential election? Are you like on CNN checking what's happening next? Or are you like off in the woods sort of feeling the soil? in your bones like where are you in this whole thing look we we live in a world where the presidential election follows us no matter where we are right i mean yeah that's that the last one especially felt like whether that. whether we're couldn't shake it whether we're watching big brother doesn't matter because big brother's watching us um and so yeah we were all aware of the the trump phenomenon we uh <clears throat> we just spent an institute in february trying to debrief the the, the spiritual and political character of um, of this moment in U.S. history, like like, what, like a retreat, or you you. Uh, yeah, we, every year we hold an institute called the Bartimaeus Kinsler Institute. It's a five day intensive where we work at the intersection of scripture and social justice and and movement history, and uh, we we gather up in in the Ventura River watershed. Um, so we had. Uh, uh, 60 or 70 folk really hunkered down for a week to try to make sense. And we, and we did that by reading this moment through the lens of uh, Martin Luther King Jr.'s uh, Beyond Vietnam sermon, uh, the 50th anniversary of which we just celebrated last month on April 4th. And that's the sermon, as you know, where King famously named the giant triplets of racism, militarism, and poverty in, uh, as the great American pathologies. And we tried to um, understand the Trump phenomenon through the older wisdom of King's vision because, uh, because we have seen this moment before in American history, more often than we might think, uh, where um, what uh, is popularly called now, I think Van Jones was the first one to, to uh, call it white lash. Mm -hmm. uh, American history is full of white lash. Uh, but we modern people don't necessarily understand that history, so... Um, certain folk are stunned by the white lash that Trump rep represents. Well, the re you know the the Reconstruction was dismantled by white lash in, in the American South in the late 19th century. Um, the Progressive Era during the Depression was dismantled by white lash uh, in the 1940s. Um, Civil Rights Movement uh, was always up against white lash in, in the 50s and 60s. So this and what is that at a deeper level? Mm. Yeah. What is that? What white lash is? No, we're in control. Yeah, yeah. Well, this is again where where Elaine's work comes in so importantly that that you have people trying to um, you you have the inheritors of a colonial project, the the inheritors of a of an imperial project where some folk came, invaded somebody else's country, took it over, called it their own, um, having. Um, domesticated, um, militarily speaking, the indigenous inhabitants, then turned to domesticating the landscape and its resources and extracting its resources um, and sort of destroying anything that was in the path of that grand vision, uh, there's going to be some trauma. And not just trauma uh, among the victims, there's plenty of that, but there's, there's yeah. internalized uh, self-hatred, um, ambivalence, um, uh, what what are we really doing to these people? Do I really believe in this enough to do this? And yet it, 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 it uh, blows up in p particular historical moments. And whatever the animating myth is that's driving that conquest is compelling enough or it's whatever enough, coercive enough that people just go along. I love it how people will say that the U.S. was discovered by Christopher Columbus, but then talk about the people who are already here. Yeah. Like there was somebody here. So that's less of a discovery. <laughs> And more of an invasion. Yeah, which which brings me to a, a story I'd like to tell about 1992, which was the quincentenary of Columbus falling on the the lands of Hispaniola. Um, 1992 was a, a time in which the attempt to reassert the myth of of Columbus and, and European entitlement and doctrine of discovery 
um, <clears throat> was set to be celebrated, but indigenous people all over the world rose up in a, an amazing popular movement that pushed back so hard on that that most of the Columbus quincentenary celebrations were canceled because indigenous people were saying, ah, no, we're not celebrating this, and there's part of the story you're not telling, and, and there was a certain shame factor, I think, in, in the colonizing mentality. Well, right in the middle of the 1992 quincentenary, uh, the jury uh, that was uh, deliberating over the four officers that beat Rodney King publicly in the streets of Los Angeles came, um, acquitted those officers, and um, 25 years ago last Saturday uh, was the Los Angeles uprising. Uh, the largest civil disturbance in the history of the United States. Uh, right in the middle of the quincentenary, when we're struggling with that deep legacy of colonization, we have to confront the endemic social and political and racial disparity right here in the City of Angels. Now, that was the second time in my life, Rob, that I'd seen this city burn. The first time was 1965. I was 10. 1992 was different. I wasn't a suburban um, being protected from all of that. I was on the streets trying to work for justice while keeping the peace. And it was a, it was a shit show. Uh, there were 63 people killed, a billion dollars worth of property damage done. Uh, <clears throat> and, and, you know, as, as King put it when he was here in 65 after the riots, he said, the, a riot is the language of the unheard. So here I'm in the middle of this thing, and uh, after 25 years ago yesterday, was the, the, the fires had finally died down after three long days, of rioting all over L.A. County. Fires finally died down. And I got news that there, was, uh, there were spontaneous groups of people roaming all over Los Angeles doing cleanup. So I jumped in my truck went down to South Central, started working on tearing down charred buildings, throwing the debris in the back of the truck. It was this most amazing moment of grief and, uh, and love and uh, um, confusion. But folks from all over LA just des descending into the riot zone and, and helping clean up. And that was a really a beautiful experience of, of uh, community mm -hmm. in, in the aftermath of disaster. Later that afternoon, I had a date to keep with a friend that I didn't really know that, that well, but it was one of these social obligations. So I went to his house for a Kentucky Derby party. And I was late, so it, with unaccountable stupidity, I decided to just go straight there and not clean up first. So here I walk in the door all grimy and blackened into a room full From of white people. literally rebuilding the city. Or cleaning it up. In, into a Pasadena veranda full of white people dressed in white. I guess that's a thing for the Kentucky Derby. And, <laughs> and I walked in and you'd think I'd taken a dump on this guy's veranda. You know, talking stopped, nervous laughing. Who's this dude who just walked in with charcoal all over his face? It was just... And, but at that moment, and, and, and then, you know, I have this conversation with this guy who starts talking about... Clearly, his only experience with African Americans is he's met them as stable workers at the place where he keeps his horse, and he starts talking about how the Mexican workers work harder than the black workers, and I just go off, right? It's just... Do you uh, really? Yeah, I do. It, was, you it just, was not pretty, and it was You lose it in your charcoalness. I, well, I did. I mean, you know, I, I just lost all my filters, and I'd just been, you know, th through this really... Here, clearly, were What'd people you say, by the way? Who, you, were, who were neither... Um, impacted by uh, or cared about what had just gone down. And it's like a couple city. of miles, literally, as a literally, bird Literally, as fly. a crow flies. And, uh, and, and so anyway, I, I've soon had the good sense to escort myself out of there. But what it, what it really brought home to me in, the, in one of these existential moments that we all have is that it, the sheer cruelty of the gulf that exists between um, the haves and the have-nots, between the privileged and the marginalized, so that literally these people at the um, Kentucky Derby party could be fiddling while their city burned, just like Nero. And I thought, wow, there's a, there's a moment of truth. And, and so it's that moment of truth that has fueled my journey to try to figure out what does the gospel have to say to this? Um, and how do we make choices 
to be discontinuous, to live in discontinuity to the, the kinds of insularity and hardness of heart that um, suburban uh, entitlement have constructed and try to build bridges across these gulfs. Um, but yeah, that was, that was right in the middle of the quincentenary, and it was 25 years ago this weekend, uh, and it's I've been thinking about it a lot. Yeah. Wow. Now, from what you have seen, I know for many people, the, when they begin to see what it's really like, this system and what it does, and what it has done to people, there is an overwhelming despair. It was almost a catatonic, like a yeah. paralyzed, oh, it's, yeah. the problems are too big. But you have like a calm, well, we, could do, we can do some stuff here. Yeah. How did that, were you all, I mean, obviously you were marching at 14, so you had some sense like humans can act, we can resist, we can do good things, we can plant some flowers, we can whatever. Yeah. Uh, Michael Lerner, who's, who's one of our, I think you, you know Michael Lerner's uh, work, a uh, great rabbi up in the Bay Area, who edits Tikkun magazine. He wrote a book a, a couple of decades ago called Surplus Powerlessness, in which he analyzes the way in which our society actually breeds despair, particularly among privileged people, who yeah. when their eyes are opened to the nature of um, white supremacy and its cruelty or... Um, wealth disparity, um, immediately go into this place of being paralyzed. And Michael, I think, rightly suggests that that is a socially engineered condition of helplessness. That um, actually... What do you mean by socially engineered? Well, meaning that we've, we've imbibed this. We, we learn this through the social systems that actually educate us. Not just the school systems, but the advertising system, the culture system that constantly focuses on heroic individuals um, that leaves the rest of us kind of feeling like, well, I'm not really very extraordinary, I can't do much, and then when I encounter a vast social issue, oh, I'm just one person. So we're socialized in this country to feel omnipotent as consumers, because advertising 3,000 times a day is telling us that the corporations have it all, right. are interested in me and my desires, but we're also educated to be helpless in the face of um, social problems. And, and that is where social movements, for all of their um, <clears throat> uh, you know, dysfunction and clay feet, social movements are attempts to animate a, a political imagination and a social practice that um, actually rehabilitates the democratic impulse. That is the, the impulse that um, ordinary citizens can and should act conscientiously. That's actually a, 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 a allegedly revered um, ideal in our country, but the way people are mostly uh, socialized is to feel helpless, to, to let the experts uh, do something about it, um, or just to hope against hope that someone will do something. Uh, and and that's, that's part of the, one of the real pathologies of helplessness. And unfortunately, our churches are deeply complicit in that. Um, and, and part of it is that our churches, like the movie theaters, are set up to accommodate spectators and performers. Uh, and the spectators really don't have much responsibility to do anything. It's kind of religious entertainment, and you come. It's kind of a second-rate entertainment anymore, so that's one of the reasons our churches are dying. But, but, it, but imagine what a church could do to recover its roots as an animating social movement, where everybody who shows up is expected to, to actually be part of a movement. Um, now, the one exception in spiritual movements in the last 75 years, something that Tom and Lindsay here are deeply involved in, is the 12-step movement. You can't mm -hmm. come to a 12-step meeting to be a spectator. Right. You, you, the only reason you're there is to work on your own issues of addiction. Well, you, if we would um, broaden that analysis to, 
to actually start addressing the public addictions that are killing us. There are plenty of private addictions that are killing people, but there's also public addictions that are killing us. Uh, then why couldn't our churches turn into 12-step meetings where everybody who shows up is there because they understand it's a life and death struggle to come to health, to be liberated from our enslavement. Wow, there's Exodus again. And to come into beautiful renewal and wholeness come on. Through, through a discipleship, the root of discipleship is discipline. The root of the 12-step movement is disciplines, but disciplines in a community of recovery uh, in which we're, we've never arrived. We're always on the journey to getting healthy. I mean, that's a great model for church. Well, there's no accident that the 12-step movement actually came out of the Oxford Revival movement in England in the 1930s. It is theologically based, but most of the 12-step movements now that meet in church basements yeah, are right. secular movements. <laughs> we have a lot to learn from that. Absolutely. Now, um, I'm thinking, I, I want to loop back to something you said, because um, Martin Luther King naming racism, poverty, and militarism, and I'm thinking about the people who would listen to this and say, what do you mean by militarism? Don't we need to protect our country? What's the problem? What about our valiant, brave soldiers who make it possible for us to right. consume. Um, right. and I mean that in a positive sense and in a, uh, taking a jab. H how do you um, address, how would you explain to somebody the industrial military complex, militarism, the vice president, a former vice president being the CEO of a company that makes weapons? How do you, yeah. how do you explain that? Because that feels like the thing, um, I noticed so I've had a, 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 a solid um, contingency of people who didn't like my work over the years. No and doubt. Joy, you know, welcome. Yeah. Or, I, or you're welcoming me to your club, yeah. however it works. <laughs> and what was interesting to me is talking about spiritual matters and how you read the Bible and heaven yeah. and hell, um, that gets a certain thing going. Yeah. But when I... It was the Iraq War that, like, opened yeah. my eyes... It did something to me that I've never, once you taste, you can't untaste. Yeah. Um, and then you begin to realize how many very wise, articulate, seasoned voices over the years, yeah. all the way back to, was it George Washington who warned about standing armies? Yeah. Oh, and then, and then um, you go to an NFL game and they yeah. bring a flag out. Where do they get those flags? Well, They're first bigger off, there's than the a world. flag. Then... The flag started getting bigger. Then the flag covered the field. <laughs> then the flag had soldiers holding the edges. Bless, nothing but love for everybody. Then we had a military band. Yeah. Then we had the singing of the anthem. Don't forget the jets. Oh, oh, we're getting there. We're getting yeah. there. We're, we're building up to that. And I remember being at a sporting event and we sang the national anthem, which included bombs bursting in air. Yeah. I was like, this tribe, when it gathers to sing about its most cherished, intimate, founding narrative, yeah. we sing a line about bombs. Yeah, and then they started doing the F-14 overhead. And it's like, it started to be like, okay, NFL, I get it. Apparently we're in America. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. And next we're going to have like an aircraft carrier in the parking lot. Like it just, it, um, <laughs> I know, good idea. How do you, yeah. and, and once you, once you begin to see this, this is no disrespect to the people who do protect us and keep us free, but you realize that this system, it's almost like it's water that we're swimming in unless you drag the fish up on the beach yeah. and beat it silly. Yeah. It and doesn't it, know what you're talking about when you talk about water. And ironically... Good Lord, that was our, a long question. Our Christian church... Um, oh, my word. Was, ...was actually birthed out of a struggle between liturgies, the liturgy of the Roman Empire, which had all the trappings that you just named in its own way in the first century, and the counter-liturgy of these small Christian house churches that were hijacking some of the language and giving it new content. Um, why do we buy into the imperial liturgy today? And everything you just named is a massively choreographed public liturgy oh, of empire. Incredible. It's overwhelming, really. Um, well, how, how, do, how does one answer this? Um, I remember, by the way, to interrupt you real quickly, I remember realizing, learning that the Pentagon spent a billion dollars a few years ago on advertising. Yeah, how about that? I was like, wait, 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 wait. I, my tax money is being spent to advertise to me 
the military, yeah. which which, just, su which suggests there might be a little bit of a um, legitimacy crisis there. Um, you know, the national anthem wasn't sung. <laughs> you delivered that line. American, um, oh my word! The national anthem wasn't sung at American sporting events until World War II, right? So it, it in and of itself has always been sort of hooked to an attempt to build popular consensus around a war. For, for us, as we face these issues, and we face them every day, we have found such wisdom in King's 1967 sermon. It was the most courageous and consequential public address, not just that King ever gave, but in the history of the United States, in, in our opinion, in which he is joining his considerable moral authority as a civil rights leader to the anti-war movement. Uh, at a time in 1967 where he, he then loses his support in the Johnson administration, uh, who's infuriated that he's come out publicly against the war. Uh, this is a magnificent catechism in understanding How do you explain the catechism to somebody who's... Basic, basic uh, talking points mm -hmm. on the, the history and culture of American militarism. If, if I wanted to point somebody to try to understand militarism, I would say, what would Martin say? Uh, here, read the speech. So many of us have been on a campaign for a couple of years now, leading up to last April 4th's 50th anniversary of the delivery of that sermon. Courageous because he was going against the stream consequential mm -hmm. because he was assassinated exactly a year later, almost to the hour. And uh, in this, and part of this campaign has been Tommy's uh, radicaldiscipleship.net blog site, which all through Lent, I thought that was very genius, Tommy took a, uh, he exegeted the entire sermon um, and then had commentators, so just like you would a Gospel of Mark, he, he, there would be a paragraph or two from this sermon. It's that good and it's that um, uh, it has that continuing relevance. Fascinating. So in 2003, Elaine and I are in Memphis. We'd be, we, we were invited to be um, guest professors at Memphis Theological Seminary. And neither of us had ever lived in the Deep South, and there's not many places deeper than Memphis. Uh, and we were astonished at the racial segregation, at the endemic poverty there. But we're, we're teaching, it's going along very well. People are really open to what we're talking about, social issues and um, connecting discipleship with, with public witness. And everybody's loving it, black and white students. And then on March 4th, Operation Shock and Awe hits, 2003, the second Gulf War. Uh, and it immediately becomes, uh, everything gets polarized. Uh, the fog of war descends. A great and, documentary, by the way. Yeah. And, and, and people, um, particularly in the Deep South, the, the patriotism is just as thick as a knife. And we were, we were a little, um, like we knew it was going to be hard, but we were a little unprepared for that kind of phalanx, that wall of uh, Which was patriotism. unquestioned support for those who fight for our country. Don't even, don't even mention it, right? Don't even bring it up. So we got people walking out of our classes and so on. So we decided we would try just using the text of Martin Luther King's Beyond Vietnam Sermon. Uh, heck, the guy, the guy has a national holiday, right? He's as American as apple pie. Let's just use the text and see how that... And that was a very interesting uh, learning experience. We went to churches and we were pretty much run out of white churches and warmly embraced by black churches who understood what King was trying to say about American society. Uh, so, you know, social location is everything, and, and that was a very deep learning for us about the deep relationship between a culture of militarism and the other pillars of the social status quo. And, and that's what make, makes King's um, sermon so important. Uh, your listeners can find this sermon. It's all over on the web, Beyond Vietnam, A Time to Break the Silence. Um, it is just a Pre it's prophetic in the true meaning of that word. That is not foretelling the future, but talking about the mm -hmm. con inevitable consequences yeah, of bad behavior. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, if they want to look at the RadicalDiscipleship.net uh, site, it's got a, this great exegesis of, uh, what was it 40 days of, of King's sermon? Uh, so so that, that continues to be a, a great tool. And, and I, I mention that because really the, what we're up against in the Trump administration Right? You yourself have said on your podcast, there's nothing particularly new about this. Actually, there's some very deep old stuff happening here. 
which means we're also going to be having to draw on very old, deep wisdom to counter it. And that's going to mean yeah, well said. not only are we going to have to be theologically sophisticated, we're going to have to reground ourselves in the radical roots of our tradition as a tradition of counter-liturgy to empire, but we're also going to have to learn our, our social movement history and understand that every season of American militarism has had an edge of dissent, has had an edge of democratic resistance. And those edges uh, exist today. So the question is uh, not what do I do about militarism, but where do I find kindred spirits to start to push back on this? Because they exist. Sometimes we have to go look for them because we don't get prime time at uh, halftime on, on football day. <laughs> okay, I would love to see your, your mind, like speed round, as with your knowledge of resistance movements, social movements, propaganda, ha, uh, tell me, make America great again. If you just had to riff on that, or follow quickly, we used to win. We don't win anymore. With me, we'll win. What is that at a yeah. at a at a at a language semantics like? What is make America great again? Yeah. Well, I suppose it's not um, terribly surprising that Trump couldn't even be original. That was actually a slogan in the Reagan campaign. Um, was it really? Oh yeah. Uh huh. Um, <clears throat> but of course, Trump. Trump has, has, has used it and, it, and it resonates to, to all of those who feel like this unquestioned um, omnipotence of American culture and politics, uh, the unchallenged supremacy of white male business guy um, is being challenged. So I think we all understand how that has resonated. Mm -hmm. My favorite counter trope, of course, is... Um, coming from the Chicano community, which is Make America Mexico Again, um, <clears throat> which certainly works here in the Southwest. <laughs> um, but, uh, you know, I think that that's where our counter-liturgy, you know, Christianity and Jesus in particular was already interrogating greatness, right? What does it mean to be great? Mm -hmm. To be great is to be a servant and to take one's social stance alongside the marginalized and the invisible and the poor. That is the nature of greatness. So um, let's not just look for an alternative soundbite. Let's interrogate what greatness actually means, um, particularly socially and politically. And there's plenty of that in our scriptures if we want to look there and if we have eyes to see. So, so, for, so for the... the so for the person who's had a public freakout on Facebook over the past four months about where's it all going, I don't know what, you, I pick up from you, you would say to them, whatever it is that disturbs you, unnerves you, is keeping you up at night, you're worried about what kind of world your kids are, you would say, what is it that disturbs you? What is that liturgy? What are the beliefs that animate that? Now, what is the counter to it? Yeah. I mean, well, I pick up from your work, the antidote to the despair and the fear and the <gasps> is, think about it, analyze it, understand what it is that's disturbing you, and then construct the thing that is the opposite of that. Uh, yeah, um, construct... Or whatever the word is. ...is, is a, oftentimes, I think, a little pretentious that, that we use that a lot. I think it's more, we need to apprentice ourselves to traditions that have been in resistance to this stuff long before we encountered it on our Facebook page. This is an old struggle. This river's been running all the way back to Moses. Uh, it's been discovered by the prophets in the wilderness. It was rediscovered by uh, John the Baptist and uh, rediscovered by Jesus in the wild waters of the Jordan. Uh, try sometime to read one of Paul's jail epistles through the lens of King's letter from Birmingham yeah. jail, right? There's all kind of resonance. Uh, rediscovered by the monastic movement in the 4th century as the Roman Empire was falling apart. Rediscovered in the 11th century by the Franciscans and the Waldensians and the Anabaptists and the Radical Reformation and Methodist reformers and Catholic workers. In other words, there's been this strand of faith-based resistance. Um, all the way along, and our, the invitation is for us to uh, find those places and um, join our life energy to that 
rather than fretting on face page, uh, on, on Facebook. Um, we are we are up against some some hard times, but there are people who, um, for one thing, um, African Americans been fighting this stuff for 300 plus years. They've got some wisdom. Show up at a black church, um, hang out at a synagogue, um, or go to a Passover meal and hear about that ancient counter liturgy of a journey from slavery. We actually do have resources. I think more the challenge is undomesticating our resources from that grip. Yep. So I don't know how many of your, um, your folks remember The Matrix, but I know you do, one of the great <laughs> prophetic films. And, and, and you know, um, Morpheus saying, it's the world that's been pulled over your eyes, right? One of the great lines. But Neo is invited not to go home and you know, construct an alternative idea. He's actually invited into a journey. Um, into a discipleship, into a community of resistance, which he then apprentices to and sort of discovers who he really is and who his vocation is. Well, it turns out that's the gospel story. Uh, that's the call to discipleship. Yeah. That's why we think it's more relevant than ever. Ah, oh, I love it. I love it. My friends, raise your glasses. So good. There's a drinking game involving my podcast. Yeah, I've heard. People, so, um, it's pretty dry around this uh, okay, back I got, house what here, it, man. <laughs> 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 that is a good one. Okay, a couple more, a couple more questions yep. that I want to help people know where they can go, point people to where they can go to hear more about this. But um, you, this for you, the Jesus path. You be, you believe, or this is real to you. There's like a heartbeat underneath all this for you. So far, <laughs> still ticking. Yeah. Yeah, it is. Yeah, it's very, you know, all of this stuff has to be personal and not just political. Um, that, that's one of the many dualisms we always try to overcome. So we're as, in, we're as interested in spiritual direction and <clears throat> marriage and family counseling, the kind of work that Lindsay and Tommy do, as we are with trying to get people to march around climate or um, uh, the commemorative conference we had in Koreatown around the L.A. Uprising uh, commemoration. We're always trying to work both those things because we understand that um, we are whole people, our hearts are important, our spirits are important, and where we place our bodies in social space is important. So we, we endeavor to be holistic. Um, we, we think that the radical discipleship paradigm um, gets past the, the gridlock um, of American, particularly American Christianity, which is... Um, that, that, that you have uh, evangelical decisionism, right? You just make a decision, and then boom, you're done. Uh, you have mainstream denominationalism, which has come join our brand, even though it's dying. Uh, and then you have all sorts of different kinds of fundamentalist dogmatisms, which um, are so often toxic and, and destructive. Um, and we, so we think discipleship is the antidote to dogmatism, denominationalism, and decisionism, that it's important to make decisions, it's important to have communities of tradition, and it's even important to have some good talking points. That's all dogmacine means in the, in the Greek. But at the end of the day, it's about a path. It's, a, it's what Buddhists would call a practice, right? A daily practice. Um, we Christians um, have forgotten that discipleship is a daily practice. Um, we've forgotten that it is... Um, it's a political proposition that, that has a cost to it, as Bonhoeffer tried, tried to remind us. Uh, and I think, uh, I think we are, well, look, you are part. I, I came up in the 1970s. Uh, and the 1970s was very similar to now in that it, it, there was a whole exodus of evangelicals away from Cold War church culture and Vietnam War era stuff. And that was the flowering of sort of creative, intentional communities, social movements like Sojourners. Richard Rohr, your buddy, who was uh, on the Robcast not too long ago, came up out of that movement. That's what the movement I came, in, uh, came up with. You know, I was rolling with Richard and Jim Wallace and those folks in the 70s, and we were trying to ask these questions. 30 years later, there's a 30-year cy uh, cycle philosophy of American history, we have a similar disillusionment happening. What's happened in the meantime is that evangelicalism became the institutional church in America. That wasn't true 40, 50 years ago. It is true now. 
But there's been this disillusionment that's been going on for as, about as long as you, you know, been on your exodus. It's happening all over the place. People are running, screaming from, from church. They're trying to find, now many of them are saying to hell with it. And, and we understand that. They're trying to escape the straitjacket. But a whole bunch of other people are looking for, you know, they're like I was as someone not raised in church who was confronted with the gospel. And I found the gospel very attractive and the church very confusing and, and sort of not very interesting. So there's a whole bunch of people now who are also looking for discipleship as this kind of antidote, a discipleship that's not just about who you sleep with, which is how it tends to get done in conservative <laughs> churches, but actually how you live the entirety of your life and how you handle your money and how you deal with your privilege and where you put yourself in relationship to marginalized people and so on. I think that's, uh, that's a gospel whose time has come again. Uh, you are part of, very much part of that movement. Uh, there's lots of folks out there. But it's easier to leave than to come or, or to find your home. It's either, easier to leave your, your mm -hmm. parents' house than it is to find a home. And it's either to, easier to deconstruct the dysfunctional than it is to actually shape and curate something that is a positive, constructive alternative. And, uh, and that's where... Um, soundbite socialized um, suburbanites and others are going to have to do some harder work to move outside their comfort zone, to move across social boundaries, to get to know others, uh, to read some history, and to, to not um, be content with abandoning church. Because it might be brave to leave church, but it's braver to rebuild church in a way that is going to be a church of solidarity, a church of justice, a church of personal nurture, a, per a, a church where fidelity to relationships and to covenant um, is, is being nurtured. That's the harder piece. That's the piece that we all are, are trying to be about now, and um, that's hopefully what, what we're trying to, to do in our little corner. Okay, let's talk about the we then. Yeah. Can people come study with you, learn from you? Uh, walk around the woods with you? Like, how do people can... Yeah. So, so first off, people want to read your books. Where would you have them start? Uh, I think uh, wh where we often point folk is to the popular popularization of the Mark Commentary, which came out in 1996, called Say to This Mountain, Mark's Story of Discipleship, um, that was written collaboratively with some folks in which we read Mark um, in a more popular fashion and then talk about what it means. Um, say to this mountain. Say to this mountain. Okay. Um, Mark's story of discipleship that was uh, published in 1996. Um, we, uh, there, there are several places where people can find us. Um, our host website is chedmyers.org. That's M-Y-E-R-S, chedmyers.org. And in that, on that site, um, you can find webinars, podcasts. Um, we run online um, educational stuff, classes. We have cohorts. We've had several cohorts of, of women that Lindsay and Elaine have been a part of that we call Feminary. Uh, that has been really great, and we, we really want to... Uh, uh, Feminary. Yeah, pretty cool. There you go. Uh, oh, encouraging women to, to continue to live into everything that they awesome. bring and to overcome the barriers to, to women's voices in the church and in, in the culture. Um, so we call that Bartimaeus Institute Online. Um, all of that can be accessed. Our, our website is, all of our publications, Elaine and my publications, are, are there that can be downloaded on our chedmyers.org site. Uh, you'll find a link to the radicaldiscipleship.net <coughs> site there, as well as um, our watershed discipleship um, stuff, which is more of our recent work over the last few years, trying to layer in the, the eco-justice work into the rest of this. Yeah. Um, our, our flagship uh, community is really the what we call the Bartimaeus Kinsler Institute, named after beloved elders of ours right here in Los Angeles who were longtime Presbyterian missionaries um, in Central America who were heroic parts of the um, sanctuary movement of the 1980s, which is now being reproduced in uh, today by young evangelicals in the Matthew 25 movement. So the Kinslers are elders of ours, and so we named this institute after them. It's been going about uh, 12 years now, and we meet every February up in um, Ventura County, north of Los Angeles. 
Um, and that's where we build a community of conviction and courage. And um, <clears throat> uh, we invite people to join us for a five-day intensive where we work at the intersection of scripture, social justice, spirituality. Um, and then we, uh, um, some of us travel. Um, we, we can come to... To, to you, you can come to us. We have internships, we have study fellowships, um, we got people on the road. We would love to hook folks around the country up with the network of people that we know. We've been networking this movement for 40 plus years, so we know people all over um, North America and beyond, and would love to. That's the best thing if somebody writes us, we're happy to help them find a kindred spirit who, who can um, help uh, accompany them. Um, so there's lots of ways to, to do that, and, and the, the easiest way to find all that will, would be to get on chedmyers.org. I love it. I'm such, a, I'm such an admirer. I'm cheering you on. I'm Thank a fan. You. Appreciate I, it. It really moves me deeply what you're doing. Yeah. Well, thanks. And I have a strong sense that a lot of my folks will want to connect with you in some way. That'd be great. Let's go surfing. Oh, my word. No, you, you seriously surf? I seriously surf. Friends, this just went to a whole new level. Do you really? Wait, I'm not at the moment because I'm on the DL because of a torn rotator cuff, but yeah, for 40 plus years. Friends, a couple of worlds just collided and my heart leapt. Let's just be honest here. Let's go surfing. So I go surfing with Chad Myers. That could happen. Let's do it. You could hook me up with Chad, oh, the surf session with Chad Myers. That would get, good Lord, that'd be a good time right there. Yeah, yeah. I would raise my glass the whole time. Yeah. Fantastic. Thank you so much for coming yeah. to the back house. Thanks. Thanks this for having really, us. really, really, really wonderful. Thanks for hosting us all. Yes, of course. Grace and peace, my friends. Peace.